I guess if there's somebody that can tell us about run over flowers, it's Jorge Valdez. It all started when he was 10 years old, fleeing from Havana, Cuba to Miami, hoping to find a free country. And he tells us the story when he got to the Havana International Airport, he was holding his little sister's hand and his little brother's hand, and the government official said, you can go with your three kids in the airplane, but your wife needs to stay here in Cuba. And Jorge Valdez tells in his story that he remembers when his father looked straight into his eyes and he said, now you will take your brother and your sister to Miami and I'll stay here with your mother. Jorge Valdez tells in his testimony that that day that truck ran over his flowers because he got into that plane and he said, I will hate God for the rest of my life because my dad and my mom are staying in Cuba and I have to go, and I have to, go to Miami by myself. The story tells us, according to Jorge, that he grew up in the streets of Miami looking for food for his sister and his brother. Every step he would take in Miami, he would think God doesn't exist. And if he does, I choose to hate him for keeping my father and my mother in Cuba and from bringing me here alone to take care of my little sister and my little brother. I guess Jorge Valdez knows about run over flowers. But I guess here in the USA, everybody in the city knows about run, run over flowers. I guess the immigrants, the people that have no papers to work, know about that. There's a story about this Latino that went looking for a job, but he didn't have papers, so he couldn't get a job. Finally, one of his friends said, hey, there's a guy that doesn't require legal papers, but he needs you to know English. Can you speak fluent English? And he said, si. Sí. And he said, well, I guess you understand, but you need to be able to speak. So are you willing to go? He said, I'll go. I'll go, I'll go meet the guy. So he goes into the office, very nice office, and the guy says, please sit down. And the guy sits down, and the guy says, well, you know that I'm looking for somebody that is bilingual. In other words, knows English and Spanish. You know how to speak English. Si, sí, señor. I mean, I mean, yes, señor. And he said, well, can you construct sentences, like whole sentences? And he goes, si, sí, senor. I said, well, I need to know, so I want you to make a sentence, a complete sentence. Do you understand? He says, si, sí, senor. And he said, well, I want you to build a sentence with green, pink, and yellow. Oh, that's easy, senor. Okay, go ahead. Well, the phone greens, I pink it up, and I say, yellow. <laughs> that's me the whole way, man. Latino man, I guess he understands about getting run over by a truck because he's in a situation where he finds no hope, where other people are deciding his future. I guess in your city, you know kids that have been run over by a truck because of drugs or because of dad or their mom or an uncle that abused them physically or sexually or emotionally or maybe a broken home. I guess we talk, we work with broken lives in ashes. Jorge Valdez, Jorge Valdez tells the rest of his story of how when he was 17, he was going to wash this guy's car. And he said, will you wash my car? And he said, okay, I'll wash your car. And he did such a good job that this businessman paid for Jorge to go to the university. And he graduated with an accounting degree. And he gave him one of the accounts in Miami. And when he was like 20 years old, he was handling millions of dollars to this sardine company he's not sardine company millions of dollars i'm gonna go meet this guy because he's one of my best clients so at 20 years old he went to miami looking for this place and it was a sardine company quote quote he went in and there was only one sardine and he thought well this is not a sardine company yes it was el cartel de medellin the number one drug cartel in the world then and Jorge Valdez started laundering money for the Cartel de Medellin. And at 21 years old, he would go to the Chevy dealer and he said, Oh, I like that Corvette, that blue one. But I like the black one and the red one. Give me one of each color, please. He tells a story in his testimony where he would go to the judges that were dealing with drug dealers. And the same judges would go to his house, to his mansion in Miami, holding hands from other with gay people and sniffing cocaine and smoking marijuana, the same judges that were sending people to jail for that. Jorge Valdez can come out with this story for many years. Jorge Valdez said that at 21, he didn't need God. He was 
in the ashes, but he didn't really know it. Jorge Vadez tells the story when he went to Panama, I mean to Co Colombia for a cartel meeting, and on the way back his, his jet crashed in Panama, and he was tortured for nine months. He escaped, made it back to Miami, and he said, well, somebody wants to kill me. This is not good. I need to protect myself. But I don't need God. God can't protect me. God doesn't exist. I hate God because he left my parents in Cuba. At 22 years old, he was making so much money. He had mansions. He had yachts. He had cars. He had women. He would have orgies in his house. He thought he was living it out, but he was in ashes. And then he tells the story of how there was a very important meeting here in L.A. from all the cartels. And he was not feeling good. And he sent his assistant. And while his, plant was, his jet was at the air, in the air, it exploded. And he said, well, somebody wants to take me out of this job. I'm going to get protection. So he started looking in the yellow pages, protection, 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 and found this guy that was in charge of this uh, self-defense school. And he called him up and said, will you teach me how to defend myself? And the guy said, of course, I'll show you how to defend yourself. He came up with a little bag like this, and he said, but before I teach you how to defend yourself, I'm going to teach you how to handle the sword. And Jorge Valdez said, man, he's going to pull out some big old sword and going to teach me how to defend myself. And this guy pulled a Bible out of his little bag. And I said, I'm going to teach you about handling this sword. And then I'll teach you how to defend yourself. And Jorge Valdez spit at the guy in the face. He said, how do you dare? I don't believe in God. Now you're telling me that I need God. And the guy said, well, then I can't teach you. But he was the best. And Jorge Valdez, okay, you teach me karate. And I'll let you teach me about the sword. And Jorge Valdez says in his book, Coming Out Clean, and in his testimony, that for a year and a half, this instructor would teach him self-defense, and they would read scripture together. And one night, in the middle of an orgy, Jorge Valdez heard the door knocking, and it was his five-year-old daughter looking for the dad while he was having orgies in his bedroom. He felt so filthy that he ran to the shower trying to clean himself, and he couldn't because he was so dirty inside. He was in ashes inside. He was grieving. He was mourning, and he didn't know how to get out of it. He tells in his story that he got out the window and ran, looking for his instructor in his Lamborghini, found this neighborhood in Miami where his instructor lived in a little house. And when he walked into that neighborhood, in the midst of other ashes, he found an instructor with a loving wife and his kids praising God for the food on their table. And Jorge Valdez said, I need what you have. But my money cannot buy it. And he said, well, you don't have to buy it because somebody already paid the price. And that night, Jorge Valdez went back to his mansion. And he said, God, if you're real, I give my life to you. And when he got to his house, the DA had confiscated everything. You know that Jorge Valdez went to prison for nine years? He got his Ph.D. And today, he speaks all over the country telling them about had God gave him a bouquet of roses for ashes. And that is the story that will say there's no way he would come to Christ. But last time I opened the Bible, if you have your Bibles there with me, please go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. There's somebody walking in the streets, and in the context, we know that it's a prophecy about Christ, because in Luke 4, Jesus makes reference to this passage. And listen to what the passage says in verse 3. To grant, who is to grant? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the promised Savior is here being prophesied. And this person is going to grant to those who mourn or grieve. I am 100% sure that you all know stories of people that are grieving and that are hurting in our cities. But there's three things that God's provision do for the city. And that's what I want to leave you with. Before I finish tonight. Because I have a timer here, but that clock is not a Latino clock. This is a Latino clock. <laughs> that one says I have 25 minutes, but this one says I have an hour and a half. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm confused here for a minute. You know, I'm looking 25 minutes, I'm looking an hour and a half. But I'm going to honor the 25 minutes. So in those 25 minutes, I want to share with you three things that I, are coming out from this passage. About coming out from that wreckage in our cities. I think Jorge Valdez will tell you today that he knows what this passage talks about when it says to give them a beautiful headrest or a crown or a bouquet of roses or flowers instead of ashes. Because 
when God's provision is in the city, he substitutes a crown for ashes, a bouquet of roses for ashes. When Christ is in the city, and I'm guessing, and I'm guessing that you are that Christ in your city. And I'm guessing you are that Christ in your city. And I'm guessing you are that Christ in your city. I'm going to stop guessing. I know you are that Christ in the city. So that means that the moment you step into the city and into the wreckage, God starts substituting bouquet of roses for ashes. Because we're the only people that can represent Christ. I mean, we're blaming the government. We blame everybody. In Latin America, everything is messed up. The governments are so corrupt. And we blame the governments. And it's our fault. Because the church is the only one that has the reason and the answer to the problems of this world. So I'm not going to guess anymore. I'm going to say you are the Christ in your city. And the moment you step into that city, I need to believe. That because Christ said it here. That he substituted a bouquet of roses for ashes. But the passage is not over. Rabbi tells an incredible story. I met Rabbi in the university where I graduated, Columbia International University in South Carolina. If you love missions, you have to consider this school. It's a great school. I met Rabbi the first time there. Now I serve on the board of trustees, and that school is going forward, and it's a great school. And I remember meeting Rabbi, and I remember hearing him say some amazing stories. And I remember one of the key stories I remember about Rabbi. You know what he said? He said, I met this translator that translated for me so well into his foreign language. And then they separated, and they didn't see each other for years. And you know what happened? This guy was sent to a concentration camp. And he was stuck in that concentration camp for years. And after year number three, he said, I'm not going to believe in God anymore. How is it possible? I've been serving God all this time. And look at the ashes that I find myself in. Look at the mourning that I'm going through. Look at the grieving that I'm going through. God, are you real? And the answer was, no, I'm not. So he thought. So one night he went to sleep saying, God, I believed in you. I served you. And tonight I'm going to pray that if you don't do something when I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to deny you and I'm going to hate you the rest of my life. And that morning he got up and the captain told him that today you're going to clean the latrines. And he thought to himself, thank you. Now I know that you don't exist. Because here I am cleaning the latrines in this camp, in concentration camp. And that day when he was cleaning, he saw a little piece of paper that was written in English. And he picked it up even though it was filthy, nasty, and dirty. And put it in his pocket. Because he had not seen written English in years. And that night he went back to his bedroom and he lighted a little candle. And when he opened the piece of paper after he cleaned up all the filth and all the trash. It was a page from Romans chapter 5. And he said, I can't believe God is talking to me through this piece of paper. And the whole night he read Romans chapter 8. And he was reminded that God does exist. The next day the captain said, well you did such a good job cleaning the latrines. You're going to clean it again. And he said, great. And he said, you're fooling me. You're fooling around with me. And he said, no, I would love to clean him. And every day that he would go back, he would find another piece of scripture in a crumbled piece of paper. You know how those pieces of paper got there? Because the captain used to wipe himself with scripture. And he would throw the scripture in the latrines. And that's precisely what God used. To oil his head in the mist of morning. Man, that's crazy. Because I like God to smell good. I like God to look good in church. Everything needs to be clean. Doesn't have to smell bad. But I have news for us. God's oil is not like my oil. The God I serve is in the middle of your city. Even though we don't see him like we see him in other places. But the God that I serve can reveal himself in the midst of filth. Amen. In the middle of latrines. This guy, find, this guy found that God's provision not only substitutes 
but it sustains us through the oil. Look at the verse. It says, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. But the passage is not over. Argentina, huge country. Got to love Argentina if you like steak. How many of you like steak? How many of you have been to Argentina? Only three know about steak. Argentina is incredible for steak. And Argentina has an incredible population of people and an incredible population of cattle. And they have great steak. And my radio program airs in Latin America, but especially there's an area in Argentina where cities download the radio program. And I visited Argentina. And I visited Argentina because I heard there was a prison there where the prisoners heard the radio program. So I wanted to go visit these prisoners at this prison just because I wanted to know what it was like to meet these guys that every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. they listen in shortwave or FM or AM the radio program. Now, you have to understand that that prison in particular is for really bad guys. They're there for life. No hope to come out. The pastor met me at the airport and he said, Jeffrey, we're going to go to this prison. We're going to get to visit these prisoners in, in, in this place. But you have to understand, these guys are there because they've killed people, most of them, or because they've raped people, and they're there for the rest of their lives. So he was telling me all about his work in the prison, and he was telling me about the prisoners. And I already had my mind full of all the questions that I wanted to ask these guys. But then he said, no, you're going to only be able to talk to one guy because we can't bring them all together because some that region that we're going to go, not even the guards go in there. It's controlled by them. Do you still want to go? No. <laughs> I didn't want to go. Now, after he told me that, I didn't want to go. But I was there already. So, you know, I was not going to act like I was a chicken, you know. I am, but I was not going to act like one. So I said, okay, I'll go. So we went through the whole security thing, and they check you for everything, and knives and everything. And, and, and you know, we get to the door, and, and the guard turns around. He says, you know that at this point I have to stay here. <laughs> Are you still going inside? Yes. You know, the Latino pride, you know. <laughs> si, senor. I said, okay, go ahead. So he opened the door, he locks behind us, and there's a hallway, really cool hallway, with cells all around, with little windows with bars on them. But the windows were the size of my Bible. You're thinking, how can they skip? Why do they need bars on the windows? That's how dangerous these guys are. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing here? I mean, I, and finally, we made it to this cell. They opened the door. There were three little benches there. One for the pastor, one for me, and one for the only guy that we were going to be able to meet. We sat there. And I sat there really tense, you know, when you're getting you're nervous, you're tense. Any psychologist is here, they can tell me why we get all tense. We're, either they're going to spank us or we're nervous, we're all tense. So all tense, I sat there and waiting for this guy, and I see this big guy. I could only see his height and the scar right across his face. And he came, and I'm going to be very honest with everybody here tonight. The pastor and the prisoner embraced each other like I've never seen anybody in my church embrace. And with tears in his eyes, he said, Thank you for coming. And he sat. And for a moment, I thought, one day the church will go and Christ will say, well, you never visited me. And we'll say, well, why didn't we visit you? And he said, well, I was in prison. You didn't come to see me. So I thought, I'm going to ask Juan Carlos. I'm going to say, Juan Carlos, have you seen Christ around here? Because scripture says that he is in prison. So I'm guessing you've seen him around here. And he said, oh, I've seen the spirit here. I've heard the spirit. And I said, tell me about it. And this is what he said. He leaned really close. And his face and his scar was right in front of me. 
And he said, Wednesday nights at 9 p.m., we turn on the radio program and we listen to your radio program. And then at 11, we turn it off. But every other night at 11 p.m., I sit on my toilet. And so does the rest of my friends. And we do what we do in toilets. And when we're done, we flush the toilet. And all the pipes in the prison empty out. And then I get on my knees and I open my Bible. And I preach through the toilet, and everybody in the prison hears me preach the gospel. On Wednesday, you use the microphone. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I use the toilet. I've never been compared to a toilet. But it sure feels good to know that if he can use the toilet, he can use me. Because in the midst of the ashes, God's provision not only substitutes, not only sustains, but it supplies for the need. This is what he says at the end of the passage. Verse, uh, verse 3 says, The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And let me show you something I have here before I close. Mo, can you hand me that piece of uh, wood that it's over there in that chair, please? It's on the other chair right over there behind that. Big, you can't miss it. Thank you. I'm going to confess to you that uh, I love Argentinian steak, but... Those of you that have had the incredible experience of eating at Larry Acosta's house, you know that he's an incredible cook. And here's part of his secret. I don't know if Larry's going to kill me for this, but this is red oak. I called Larry about two days ago before coming from Miami to here. In Miami, we don't have red oak. And if you cook with palm trees, it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> I've tried it already. And I said, could you please bring some, some logs because I have a barbecue when I get back to Miami with some friends and I would like to try to use some of this red, red oak. And he said, no problem. I said, well, what are you going to use to carry it? Well, my carry-on. Well, you're going to have problems going through security, you know. Here I am, Latino, <laughs> with a piece of log. You know, what are they going to say? Oh, yeah, just go ahead, you know. I said, no, Larry, I'll cut it and make it smaller. <laughs> Have you guys ever tried to cut a piece of oak? <laughs> it's solid stuff. Look at the verse. The verse ends that they may be called oaks. Of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified as far as I'm concerned what God is doing in your life and in my life is he's turning you and me into oaks of righteousness so that in the midst of the city where you serve God will be glorified Ricardo and Miriam met in the streets in Guatemala because Ricardo was in the MS-13 gang or the Salvatruchas and Miriam was in the MS-18 gang. They met in the streets, you know why? Because they hated each other. November of last year, Joe Van Dyke, some of you guys know him, he works with us now in Latin America. He was at their wedding Say that again? Yes. In the streets, they hated each other. But they found Christ. And Christ turned their ashes into a bouquet of roses. God anointed them with oil. And God supplied a garment of praise for them. And today, 
They are oaks of righteousness for the glory of God. I guess that if God can do a work in your life, he can do a work in my life, he can definitely do a work in our cities. And when Larry asked me to come back to this convention and stand on this platform, you know how I feel? I feel like a lion in the Daniel's dens. In the Daniel den, you guys are the Daniels that are in the den, in the cities. And you guys are oaks that God is preparing to create change and impact in your cities. I would like you to please stand up with me. I would love to stay here longer, but I have to go back to Miami because I have other responsibilities. But I guess the solution is come with me. <laughs> and if you can't come to Miami with me, could I just challenge you to get out of the borders of this country at some point in your life? I think it should be in the constitution of this country that every North American should go to another country and see what God is doing. Because I'm not assuming this, I'm not assuming. I don't believe that the cat died because he was curious. I believe that the cat died because he assumed something that he should have never assumed. So I'm not gonna assume. I'm gonna make a statement that is true. God is moving in our cities. But remember, he doesn't necessarily move in the way we think he might. Because in other parts of the world, he's using toilets and filth and me. So that means that he is moving in the city because you're there. And if you're there, God's provision for substituting a bouquet of roses for ashes, sustaining with the oil of gladness, and supplying a garment of praise. Because you are where God wants you to be. Right there where you are, without bowing your head and without closing your eyes, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. It's kind of hard to pray without ceasing with your eyes closed, you think? Especially in Latin America. You don't close your eyes in the metro in Mexico City, man. They'll steal everything from you. <laughs> I mean, you, got, you have to pray like this. Dear Lord, you know. In Latin America, man, you have to pray with your eyes open all the time. You know, certain places in Guatemala City with us, man, you have to be praying with your eyes open. So we can pray with our eyes open. So tonight we're going to pray with our eyes open. Are we going to bow our head? And we tell people, bow your heads like they have three or four heads, you know, bow your heads. Everybody in the church is a monster, you know, everybody, bow your heads. Bow your head. But not your heads. So let's bow our head. Let's not close our eyes. And I want to have the honor and privilege of thanking God because he's planting oaks of righteousness in a wreckage so that we can come out of that wreckage and be God's provision for the city. And as we listen to the music, as they play and we pray, I would like you to join me in prayer and say God in spite of me use me for your glory and for your honor Father I want to thank you for every single youth leader here tonight and I want to thank you for the congregations that they represent I want to pray for the kids that they represent and the families the broken families that they represent and we want to pray, Father, that you will continue to do your work in our lives. In spite of us, Father, use us. So that people in this city can see your provision. And I pray that in your mercy and your grace, you will give us the honor and privilege to see those bouquet of roses for the, for the ashes. And for those youth leaders that are tired, Maybe some of them burn out. 
I pray that in this conference, through your mercy and through your grace, you would renew them. I pray that you will prepare divine appointments for them and divine friendships and networks and partnerships so they can go back to their city. The city that belongs to you anyways because you have been walking those streets for years and you want to walk with us. And we give you the honor and the glory because you're the only one that deserves it. Father, I want you to pray this with me. I say, Father, please use us in spite of us for your glory and your honor because you're the only one that is worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.